Within my circle of friends, I'm sort of seen as the Disney guy. Sure, we're all millennials, so we're all pretty fond of classic Disney in general, but I'm the Disney guy. I wouldn't say I cross over into full-blown Disney adult territory, I've never been to Disneyland or World, nor do I have any real desire to, and I don't think I even own a single piece of Disney merch. I'm also not about to go to bat for Disney as a company or anything like that. In fact, I truly believe they're the greediest and most predatory corporation on Earth. So no, I'm not a fanboy, I just grew up with the 1990s Disney movies, and I spent much of my time as a child aspiring to be an animator. Eventually I realized I just wasn't cut out for the job, but nonetheless, my appreciation for animation as a whole means I'm always going to have some level of respect for Disney's library. And I feel like that's a pretty common sentiment. I think most people below a certain age will agree that Disney, as an entity, can eat a giant bag of dicks, and yet we probably all have a certain sense of nostalgia for the particular era of Disney we personally grew up with. That's certainly what I chalked my interest up to for a while, nostalgia. But when I was in my late teens, and that nostalgia resulted in me revisiting the Disney movies I had grown up with, I learned that that particular era of Disney, the 90s, is historically considered one of the studio's strongest decades. It's referred to as the Disney Renaissance, comprising a string of 10 commercially and critically successful film releases starting with The Little Mermaid in 1989 and ending with Tarzan in 1999. It felt validating, vindicating even, to learn that my nostalgia was actually justified that these films are genuinely seen as some of the greatest animated films ever made, and that it isn't all the result of my rose-colored glasses. In contrast, Disney's output throughout the 80s was infamously some of the company's worst. Disney was trying to distance themselves from the movie musical format at the time, and the studio had a bit of trouble adapting to the darker, edgier, and more cynical movie landscape of the 1980s. They weren't putting out many films, and the ones they did tended to not do great, Opening themselves to newer talents in an attempt to breathe new life into their projects, Disney brought on Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, the minds behind cult comedy film Little Shop of Horrors, for their newest animated film. When discussing ways to get Disney's output back on track, the two proposed a return to the style of film that had made Disney famous to begin with, musicals. And the film that would result, 1989's The Little Mermaid, was a massive hit, considered by critics and audiences as a return to form for the studio, and kicking off a decade of successful animated movie musicals. Around the same time, the company went full steam ahead on all their other media ventures as well. Throughout the tail end of the 80s, Disney would produce serialized TV revivals of classic characters and IPs, such as DuckTales and Chippendale Rescue Rangers. And to accompany this new media push, Disney would also choose to embrace the rising popularity of video games. This brought us game adaptations of the aforementioned DuckTales and Chippendale shows, as well as games based on shows created for the eventual Disney Afternoon television block, such as Darkwing Duck and Goof Troop. We even got a few original titles, like Castle of Illusion. And while licensed games throughout history have generally held a rather unfavorable reputation, these early Disney games were seen as something of an exception. None of them were outright masterpieces or anything, but Disney knew that they were out of their element when it came to making video games, and so they partnered with established and well-regarded dev studios like Capcom and Sega. Disney would mandate the creative aspects of each game, such as which characters and elements could or could not be used, but for the most part, it seems like they wisely left the actual art of game design in the hands of the actual game designers. And as the Disney Renaissance rapidly gained more and more traction, Disney would license games based on their major motion pictures as well. 1993's Aladdin video game was a surprise critical darling, with two vastly different versions being developed for the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, the former by Capcom and the latter by Virgin Interactive. Originally, the Genesis version was to be developed by Sega directly, but when Sega clearly showed more interest in their newly acquired Jurassic Park license, Disney grew dissatisfied and looked elsewhere. The Genesis version of Aladdin would launch in November 1993, a date chosen A to coincide with the home release of the film, and B because it would not overlap with the release of any Sonic games. The Genesis version was certainly the more visually impressive of the two Aladdins, with graphics that at the time seemed like they jumped straight out of the film itself, a result of Virgin Interactive working directly with Disney animators for the backgrounds and sprite work. For many, this became the favored version of the game over the Super Nintendo one. So for their next tie-in game, Disney would strive to create a more unified product between the two major consoles. At the time, Disney's next film wasn't expected to be a huge hit. It was a completely original story starring talking animal characters and was seen as the studio's B project, 
simply there to fill the gap between Aladdin and their next A-list feature film, Pocahontas, which was set to release in 1995 and was projected to pull in huge numbers. So in summer of 1994, that underdog B-project side film would see release. And it would become the highest grossing animated film in history. It's difficult to put into words how much of an instant phenomenon The Lion King was back in 1994. It was the first animated film in history to pull in anywhere close to a billion dollars. And that's in 1994 money. The only film in Disney's repertoire to ever match that level of popularity would be Frozen almost two decades later. And I was right in the middle of it. Lion King is the first movie theater experience I remember. I was obsessed with the movie when it came out on VHS. I had all the merch, the stuffed animals, the backpacks, the books, the soundtrack on fucking cassette tape, a plastic tent for some reason. I was the film's target audience. But it wouldn't be until a few years later, at a friend's sleepover, that I was finally able to experience the Lion King video game. Unlike with Aladdin, the SNES and Genesis versions were made to be basically identical. The Genesis version runs a little faster and smoother, and the Super Nintendo version in general looks and sounds a tad nicer, but that's essentially the extent of the differences. There was even an Amiga port that ran pretty comparable to those two as well, albeit it was missing three whole levels. Any other version of the game ended up outsourced to different studios. An MS-DOS release by East Point Software, Master System and Game Gear versions by Cyrox Developments, and NES and Game Boy ports by Dark Technologies. I played the SNES version for this video, so that's the one I'll be discussing here. The Lion King video game held an incredible amount of fidelity with the film it was based on. Disney chose to partner with Virgin Interactive again for this one, the studio behind the more visually impressive Genesis version of Aladdin, and again involving actual Disney animators in the creation of the game's graphical assets. It's an absolutely gorgeous game, and the soundtrack was adapted into chiptune form directly from Hans Zimmer's wonderful award-winning film score. Two particular segments of the game, this gorilla boss fight in the Hakuna Matata level and the entire volcano level, are even remnants of scenes that were cut from the final film. Voice lines from the movie are also sampled into the game, and there are a few mini cutscenes to transition in and out of levels. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. Even as a kid at the time, I think I somehow knew that this level of quality from a licensed movie tie-in game was out of the ordinary and something to be appreciated. Disney games of the era had maintained a fairly positive reputation as being an exception to the all-licensed-games-are-garbage sentiment. The only other notable standouts for movie-based games by that point, that I can recall, were a few Star Wars titles. As a game, The Lion King is a fairly standard platformer, as were most licensed Disney games up to that point. Throughout the ten total stages, you play as either a young or adult Simba, running, jumping, and fighting your way through a series of enemies and obstacles. You have a health gauge, as is expected, but also a roar meter that gradually fills up as time goes by, and once it's at least half full, you can roar at enemies to stun or stagger them, leaving them vulnerable to a follow-up attack. For the first six levels, you play as young Simba, whose only combat options are the roar and simply jumping on enemies Mario style. For the final four levels, you play as adult Simba, who is given a handful more combat options. His roar is more powerful now, and stunning enemies leaves them vulnerable to a throw move that acts as an instant KO. You also get a standing swipe that can act as a counterattack, and jumping on enemies can now be followed up with mauling them. You also get this little bitch slap move. Look at it. That's what it is. That's a bitch slap. Like any other platformer, there are various tokens to pick up throughout each level, which here grant various effects to the player, such as recovering health, replenishing your roar meter, granting extra lives or continues, or even increasing your total HP. Certain tokens will also grant access to one or two types of bonus stages, starring Timon and Pumbaa, upon level's end, which can be used to gain more lives and continues. While each stage, except for the final one, contains at least one checkpoint, as the game goes on, levels contain fewer and fewer collectibles, creating more of a challenge as you have to gain enough skill and experience to clear levels while taking minimal damage. Despite the simple mechanics, though, The Lion King is a very difficult game. Quite infamously so, in fact. Pretty much any modern discourse about the game is likely to focus very heavily on the game's relentless nature. As the story goes, Disney really pushed for the developers to meet a higher minimum playtime quota so that players wouldn't be able to finish the game within a standard three-day rental period. And since the devs didn't have time or resources to just outright create more levels, they instead just piled on the obstacles, enemies, and bottomless pits. 
In particular, the monkey throwing puzzle in the game's second level was extended to make it last significantly longer, and I suspect the annoying door maze in the Simba's Return level was also a result of this. While this game has sort of become the poster child for this type of game design, probably due to how vocal the game's creators have been about Disney's mandates, I suspect this wasn't an uncommon practice among gaming in general back then. High difficulty encourages retries, those retries can make a game seem much longer than it actually is, and minimum playtime has always been something of a selling point for video games. Upon finally finishing this game, though, I did start to wonder how much of that unreasonable difficulty curve was intentional and how much of it was incidental. I feel like that's also not uncommon for early video games. I don't think a lot of us really stop to think about how relatively new as a medium video games are. They've only been around since the late 70s. Odds are good most of us have still living relatives that are older than any video game. Throughout those early decades, game designers were still figuring things out. There was nobody to teach them, nobody knew what the hell they were doing, and everybody was learning as they went. A lot of what we call old-fashioned or retro difficulty in retrospect was often just the result of poor game design. After all, most of us were still learning what good game design even looked like. Reportedly, the game devs had to fight to keep in the basic function of changing direction while jumping, as the animators complained that there was no way to make such a function look natural. Thankfully, cooler heads prevailed there. And the Lion King game is really no different from other difficult games of its era in that respect, being full of rather questionable design choices. Those backgrounds and sprites often make interactive elements blend in far too much. It can be difficult to tell which parts of scenery you can grab onto or stand on, and that's pretty vital for a platformer. Those backgrounds and characters look great, yeah, but they were drawn for a movie screen, not for a controller. There's this moment in the game's second level where you have to grab onto a precise spot on a hippo's snout to climb up and move on, but there is no real indicator that this is what needs to be done, nor which exact pixel you need to aim for to pull it off. There are several moments where you need to swing from handhold to handhold, but Simba seem to have difficulty grabbing on a lot of the time, since the exact triggers are deceptively precise. In other words, it's all incredibly finicky. There's this infamous spot during this ostrich riding segment where you have to do a well-timed double jump to weave between these two tree branches, and even though I failed this part probably a good dozen times, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what I was actually hitting that caused me to fail, which made problem solving it frustrating. This waterfall segment in Hakuna Matata was especially tedious, as it would inevitably end with me either falling to my death or making so little headway on the falling platforms that I may as well not even be moving. Before filming footage for this video, this waterfall was the furthest I had ever gotten in this game before. Yeah, this was the first time I had actually gotten to play as Adult Simba, because young me never knew that level select codes were a thing. And speaking of Adult Simba, the combat in this game is easily its worst aspect. Enemies in this game behave either completely randomly and unpredictably, or along very rigid AI routines that are easily exploitable. There's no in-between, resulting in some of the least nuanced enemy interactions I've ever seen in a platformer. You are given a fair amount of attack options, especially as Adult Simba, but why even bother with those when 9 times out of 10 enemies will just jump into your bitch slap over and over? You're more likely to be defeated by a bunch of cheap surprise attacks and environmental hazards than you are in an actual combat situation. Critical and commercial reception to the Lion King game was rather glowing. Between its various consoles, the game ended up selling 4.5 million units, with critics obviously praising the game's sound and visuals. Game Players Magazine even awarded it the Genesis Game of the Year for 1994, amazingly beating out both Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles. It's widely considered one of the best Disney games ever made, and one of the best licensed movie tie-in games ever made. As for me, if I'm being completely honest, I think this game is carried significantly by its presentation. The difficulty is definitely the make-it-or-break-it element for a lot of people, I think. One critic at the time posited that the game was too daunting for beginner players, and yet too annoying for experienced ones. And by the time I reached the game's halfway point, I really started to feel that. If I weren't doing this for the sake of a YouTube video, odds are I would have given up on this game completely. The cheap deaths and often artificial difficulty don't so much feel like a challenge to veteran gamers, so much as just an irritating waste of time. It's an absolutely incredible looking game with great music and environments, but the gameplay itself is kinda just good, without ever really elevating to great. But you know, if the worst thing I can say about a game is that it's merely competent instead of incredible, I guess that's not that bad.